it's just too much. It's like too many, it's just like too many pictures of like your acai bowl, like too many pictures of your half marathon, too many pictures of your baby nephew, like too many videos, like too many articles that are like, what kind of bagel are you? Like what, like 21 <laughs> times Rihanna was at a beach. And it's just like, it's too much. The, the no, like the, the noise is yes. really hitting mass. And I just think real life is gonna get hot. I always wanted to be famous. Like I sang by the piano, like, like, but I was never really, I wasn't like, yeah. Like I didn't think I was gonna be famous, but I just wanted people to be like, what is happening? Like, why is this happening? You want to surprise people. Totally. You were a child actor. I was, yeah. Very, um, I had a meteoric rise and like a, you know, a really, a, a, a real quick spiral downfall all within like, you know, 11 months. <laughs> the Hershey's commercial. Uh -huh, that's what right. else was there? I did a commercial for a company called French Toast, which was like children's clothing, like sick acid washed, like denim pants with like an elastic waistband and like cargo pockets. Um, so yeah, I nailed my first two auditions. Then I got, I was going to get cast as the understudy in Lost in Yonkers, the Neil Simon play. I like show up to school. I have a magnetic earring, like a new starter jacket. And I'm basically just like, <laughs> like everybody get it, like kiss the ring. Yeah. Like I'm an actor, because back then, like if you were on a commercial, everyone saw it. Right. There weren't there weren't that many things to look at in the early '90s. Like when I was younger, I hung out with my mom a lot and wore like true to waist khakis and like a dress shirt. And I was a kind of very like I was very like high end gay power guy. I was up until I was probably like 13. I was like super high. Like I got, I think I got a manicure at like 11. Was, That's like, fancy. Yeah, I was like speaking. So to, you grew yeah. up fancy. I was just, not really, I was just, I was very personally high end. No, I paid for this manicure myself. Okay, so then you go to become an entertainment reporter. My whole shtick was that I would interview basically like bad celebrities. Like I'd interview, you know, they'd have a guy on the show who interviewed like Orlando Bloom, like about his shirt, and then I would interview like the Real Housewives of like Tempe, you know, <laughs> about like God knows what. So what that, was your favorite interview? Actually, I did the situation from Jersey Shore. Yes. I did his first interview. Ever. Was he, he nervous? So nervous and so nice. He was like, how you doing on mic? Like, you know, like, <laughs> he was like super nervous. He smelled, he had like 10, he must have put 10 bottles of cologne. He dumped cologne on his, in his eyes. He smelled insane, <laughs> but he was so nice. And then I interviewed him again, like probably 18 months later on the same show. And he was like such a diva. The Fat Jew, the old Dakota Fanning, the situation, Big Daddies, New York City, we're making magic. Go big or go home, right? When it came to creating the account, the Fat Jewish, mm -hmm. how how intent were you on that name right off the bat? No, I wasn't actually, because I was in in the uh, in the rap game, and in, when I was initially doing the E Channel stuff, I was I've always been Fat Jew, like that's always been my name. But then actually, I got kicked off Instagram the first time because I didn't really understand the rules of Instagram. So I got kicked off, and then I couldn't get the name back. So I came up with the Fat Jewish. Then I got kicked off on the Fat Jewish. But I actually, I protested outside the Facebook offices. You can watch it online. Instagram, I will not leave till my account is reactivated. What percent of your life is orchestrated for the limelight? None. In fact, like I'm actually, I'm doing a really, really bad job of like, um, of like getting all the stuff that I'm doing. Like the like people that I work with or people that know what I'm up to are basically are like the question I get the most from people who like see all the stuff that I do are like, why aren't you filming this? Like, I don't know, it's just a lot. Um, it's just a lot and you don't need it. Like some stuff is just better, it's just better as lore. It's better if I do it and I just like, I'm, I'm, I just tell you about it, you know? It doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be constant all the time. There was this, I guess you could call it a scandal about a mm -hmm. year ago. Right. You were accused of plagiarism. Right. What do you think about all of that now in retrospect? People don't understand, first of all, it didn't, the, it was just, it was basically just like a, it was basically like a, a conversation that needed to be had on the internet. It was, it was an ethos of the internet conversation. It's just there's like an older sect of people who just like came up one way, like without the internet, and there's a younger sect of people who came up with like the creative commons mindset of the internet, you know? Like everything belongs to everyone. Like if you love a meme, like set it free. Like, you know what I mean? Give it out. I, lo I genuinely like, love the internet, like more than my own actual probably parents. Um, and it was a conversation that needed to be had. Did I want to be directly in the middle of it by myself? Probably not. Um, but it was a conversation that needed to be had because a lot of people were internally within the internet complaining about it. What did you learn? 
nothing really because I knew that I already knew the, the tenets of the argument. I just wanted to hear both sides. Mm -hmm. You create white girl rosé. Right. Someone creates white boy rosé tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I look at it differently. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit different, but that doesn't make it right. Like, that doesn't make anybody right or wrong. If someone created white boy rosé, I'd, I'd look at it as healthy competition. Just really? Like, you wouldn't sue them? No, sue them. That's just not my style. Like, I just want, like, we would just make more awesome stuff. We'd go more over the top. We'd get bet, like, we're, the, like, we do the best stuff. So, like, I look at it as healthy competition. But I heard what they were saying. So what I learned was that I wanted to see where it filtered out. Like, I want I mean, it definitely got scary and exciting at times. Like, uh, I got chased by, like, TMZ and, like, an Uber. I was like, is this what Matt Damon's life is like? This is kind of sick. Was it fun? I mean, like, fun, scary. <laughs> fa fairy or scun. I don't know whichever one you want to go with. Um, some dude, like, followed me around. Dwayne Reed and was, like, recording my phone conversation. Like, there was definitely, like, a lot of stuff out there that was completely false. That's the internet. This is ultimately a business. At the end of the day, this is what is paying your bills. Well, no, not... Not the not social media, no. We what can, is paying your bills? White girl rose? No doubt. See the thing about it is is that like we're heading we're probably heading into we're probably heading into like a period of like social media burnout, you know? Like it's just like there's like URL like online, like we're hitting just like critical mass. It's just too much. It's like too many it's just like too many pictures of like your acai bowl, like too many pictures of your half marathon, too many pictures of your baby nephew, like too many videos, like too many articles that are like, what kind of bagel are you? Like what? Like 21 <laughs> times Rihanna was at a beach. And it's just like, it's too much. The, the, no, like the, the noise is yes. really hitting mass. And I just think real life is gonna get hot. So I'm moving completely the opposite way. I'm completely like basically rooted in real life. At this point, Instagram is just like, it's just for me to like be fun and have fun. Like I know a lot of, so instead of like, instead of creating more Instagram accounts and doubling down on the net, I just, I'm going IRL. So I have Rosé, um, I have a music festival called IRL that like was gonna be, you know, we, we just did the first one like nationwide. It's like a full music festival, everything's free. It's like a giant rave. I wrote a book, which people were like, why are you writing a book? And I was like, well, because I don't know, because that's weird, because it's like different. I'm doing a cologne, like I'm, I was the first like plus size male model, like the Instagram, the Instagram model is like, it's just, it's, it's not, it's, it's unsustainable. And for anyone who, for anyone who is doing it, like I, res like I respect you. Like if you want a brand to pay you and like hold up their product and get paid and you're like 20 years old, like living in your parents' basement, like that's chill. You did that. Like get money. No, I didn't do that. And you I'll did sponsorships though. Well, here, sponsored posts. Here, here's the thing why. I did sponsored posts, but only if I had full creative control and went completely over the top with everything. I would never do a branded sponsorship unless they let me do whatever and it has to be ridiculous. We built Wiker Rose from the ground up. Like, How I, involved are you in this product? Every single second. I like actually know things about wine. In 30 seconds, how is White Girl Rose created? It's like actually made by like a beautiful Italian man who has like an open shirt with like tufted chest hair in coastal California who's on some like gnocchi spaghetti, like magazzini. <laughs> like really. What does he do with the grapes? He, here's the thing, I only knew like me, so my partners, who are the guys who write White Girl Problems, have you ever seen that? Sure. So White Girl Problems, it's two brothers, and they, uh, we always wanted to create a product to like leverage our social platforms. We were like, we, we, wanted, we were talking about doing diet water, we were talking about doing vodka, but that's like a busy space. Um, we were like, we should do a rosé, because one, millennials are like, the word millennials is so stupid, but whatever, people of that age are like the biggest consumers of wine now, and they don't know any rosés. Aren't you a millennial? I'm the world's first millennial. Yeah. Okay, got I'm it. like the... <laughs> I thought I was, because I'm 81, you're 82, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm still a no, millennial you're out. as well. You're out. No, I'm in. You're out, Grandma. I'm in. I'm a millennial. 81 Listen, September, we, I'm a no, millennial. We just had that like eight months is just like, we have a generational gap. We do, <laughs> like, I'm sorry, like, Mom, I'm sorry. Um, like, when we first started it, because we were like, let's do a rosé. Like, there, so there was the, 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 so there's the fact that one, millennials drink the most rosé and they don't know the names. They walk in with like $15 and are right. like, they're like, give me something I can like pour in the pool and that'll like make me drunk. They don't care. They really don't care. They're not like, they're not swirling. They don't care about notes and like leathery undertones <laughs> and like oaky finishes. They just want something that tastes good cold. Number two, um, number two is that there was like the Hamptons rosé shortage two years ago. So the Post was running articles being like, shortage in the Hamptons, like people running through the streets, like hoarding bottles into silos. Like, so I figured, you know, I don't want to live in that kind of world, you know? Not, I don't want my children growing up in a world where there's not enough rosé. So you want to make sure you're creating it. Not if there's on, a demand, you'll fill it. Not on my watch. Yeah, find an open lane and fill it. Um, also, we, it was sort of a little bit, like, a little bit reverse engineered because just based on, like, having my platforms and interacting with people who follow me, knowing what they like, I knew they already liked it. 
You know, I knew it was something you were going to like. I wasn't going to make something and try to get them to be into it. I knew they were into it. We were all into it. I was into it. So I was like, let's just do this. So um, after the rosé shortage, we, <laughs> I wanted to, you know, make sure there was enough. You know, not all heroes wear capes. <laughs> what What's the toughest lesson you've had to learn about business throughout all of this? Is that like everything is a nightmare? <laughs> like, I want to get to that Instagram photo where I'm like in the jacuzzi that we filled with rosé and I'm drinking out of it. I want to get to that moment. But to get to that moment is like so incredibly difficult. Like so much so much brick has to be laid, so much work has to be done. Way more than you expected. On everything. Everyone just wants to stay up on everything and not do anything, but I used to have like employees and interns who I basically paid or had they had internships for college credit to just do ridiculous stuff. Read me my emails. I'd send them out and be like, find me the biggest sunflower and they'd come back and I'd be like, not big enough. It was all like for content. Now I have employees and like I have interns who actually have to do stuff. Like there's real actual stuff that has to be done. Um, but that's the thing, nobody wants to do any work. People want to grow a large social following, they want to like hold like a, a runa in their hand and then just be like, that's like I'm promoting and like get it, and, and that's fine if that's what they want to do, but that stuff's not gonna be around forever. It's just not, we're moving fast. People are burning out, there's too many social platforms. It's just like you gotta, like, you gotta, you gotta stay ahead of the curve with this. The people who are out there saying, I wanna become an influencer, yeah. I wanna start an Instagram account and get eight and a half million followers yeah. like the fat Jewish, yeah. Don't do that. Why? Because first of all, like, do not strive for it. Like, let it come to you. But we're just hitting a point of like, there's too much saturation. There's too much noise. Um, and we've really gotten away from like real life stuff. And I don't mean like, I'm not necessarily saying like hug a tree. I'm just saying like, go to a rave, you know, go to a party. So like, if you're a, if you're a young person, like you don't need eight and a half million people, like throw a really great party, like start a really good thing. Then use the internet to promote it. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to build the following so that then you can tell people about stuff. Start, do cool stuff, figure out real life stuff. Like, figure out real life stuff you can do that's really awesome and then talk to people about it on the internet because if you do cool stuff, people will want to come to it or want to want to buy it or want to talk about it. Can you freestyle a little here? I would literally do anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> Except for freestyle. I'll let, I'll let that a, slide I for am, now. Like, if you were, like, get a tattoo of, like, Rebecca Jarvis on a horse, like, now, live, I would honestly, I would get that. You'd prefer that to freestyling? No, I would actually do that. Can Free we do that? I mean, you have to set up another interview, but okay. yeah, we can do it, like, we'll do another interview, and I want to be, I don't want to be on a horse. What do just, you want to be? It's got to be something business-themed for real biz. Why can't you just be on a horse, like, looking at a chart that's, like, going up? You know okay. what I'm saying? We can we can incorporate the whole. It can be a horse. As long as you came up with it, you don't I'll have do a it. business horse. <laughs> you can have a business horse. A unicorn. There are a lot of unicorns in Silicon like Valley. Like the TV show or the actual place? Well, both. Okay. What's your biggest talent that people have not that you haven't disclosed? You haven't talked to people about? Before I got into like into anything entertainment related, I actually was uh, in my second year of dental school. Really? No. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll believe it. What do you think? Okay, so we, people you do who have nice teeth. Thanks. I'm also I'm nice. I'm actually I'm very very good at the pottery wheel. Okay. Remember my remember my early like high end yes. like, fancy days. Yeah. You I, went to pottery classes with your other mom? kids were like playing like playing going to, like batting cages and kids were like you know doing like jungle gym like stuff. Patrick Swayze. At, you know, yeah, I'm very Patrick Swayze and Ghost. That was more me at ten. I was much more like you guys have fun at the batting cage. Like I'm gonna learn the wheel. What are some other surprising things that people don't know about you? So you speak French. Right. I'm amazing at the pottery wheel. Actually, I'm a good baker. My scones are very sort of... What kind of scones? Very moist, like diced fruit, like a mango scone. Scones are always too dry, you know? It's always a dry scone. You almost like sort of in an obligatory way like need a coffee or like a cappuccino, but not with these scones. Yours don't require that. Not with these scones, Rebecca Jarvis, I'll tell you. These scones have a natural kind of... Kind of uh, kind of moisture. I also think sort of unexpectedly people, and I mean this is by design, like I really like people to kind of think that I'm like an idiot. Like that's, I like that, you know? Like I, It but insulates I, you. Yeah, but I can like, but I, like I, I have a brain. Like, you know, I actually, like we can talk about stuff. He has a brain! I'm not, how about this? Surprisingly I'm not as stupid as you think. Yeah.